I'm going to do a lesson this morning that I hope will be interesting for you. We good, Mark? Okay. Okay. All right. Let's start by, uh, let's see, turning to, go ahead and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16 and also Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2 is just going to be our uh, diving board, our launch pad, and then uh, 1 Samuel 16 is where we're going to spend most of our time today. All right. 1 Samuel 16 and Proverbs chapter 2. Okay. I hope this lesson this is going to be kind of a Bible study this morning, and I hope this is going to be interesting for you. I, hope, I really think you're probably going to learn some things and be on the lookout because uh, you'll probably hear some things you haven't heard before. So I'm going to try to teach you something that uh, um, I got from my Bible reading that I think is kind of interesting. So, so be on the lookout for new information. All right, Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1. It says, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for, what's that? Hid treasures. Okay, we're talking about the Word of God, the wisdom of God, the mind of God. He likens it to treasures that are hid in the Bible. And he says, Then thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Now, here the Holy Spirit is inviting the reader to study the Scriptures, to search the Scriptures. And the Lord is encouraging you to dig through His book as if you were mining for gold. And you know, as we know, the gold rush back in the early days of California and stuff, you know, when people find some gold, people start becoming obsessed with finding more gold. They want to find more. And the truths and secrets of the mind of God are buried in this book. And God says, hey, you know, if you're interested in my knowledge, if you're interested in knowing some of the things that I know, right? We're talking about finding the knowledge of God, the things that God knows, or even finding out things about God himself. He says, if you want to find that stuff out, get a shovel, start digging in my word, because there's a lot of treasure hidden beneath these pages. Absolutely. And I can tell you for a fact, there is treasure in this book. I mean, I've personally found some of it, and I have to tell you, I want to find some more. <laughs> I, I love finding the things in the Bible. I love just the things in my own personal devotions. When I get up early in the morning, and I'm drinking my coffee, and I'm reading through the Bible, and I say, the very first thing I say is, Lord, help me to behold wondrous things out of, out of thy law. And I love it when God either shows me information or just shows me things from my own personal life. It's like, yes, I found something this morning. It's good. And I encourage you to write those things down. Put them in a notebook. Keep a notebook handy. If God Almighty says something to you, that's probably worth writing down. And so uh, that way you don't forget, because chances are you won't remember what I preached by next Sunday. Much, and uh, that's just how we are. You know, and you're not going to remember what I said. You're not going to remember what God said either. Most of the time, God, if, if God is speaking to you on a daily basis, which hopefully he is and we all hope for, how are you going to remember what he said if you don't write it down? Because we're all just very forgetful people. There's just so much going on, it's easy to forget stuff. So I want to, um, you know, actually just, you know, for, off the, for the record, you know, or whatever, I've, I found some gold this morning reading my Bible. Did you know in uh, the story of Ahab and Jezebel, he says that uh, he wanted to buy Naboth's vineyard from Naboth, you remember that, and he said that he wanted to buy that vineyard for a garden of herbs. Why did the Bible say that? I find that really interesting. That actually, that verse right there, and, and I think it was First, it's first Kings uh, 17, right around there. He talks about a garden of herbs and like connects it to a vineyard. Grapes are connected with herbs. You say, that doesn't mean anything to me. Well, that means that, that just connected something that I've wondered about for a long time. And I'm going to do a, a lesson on that here pretty soon. It has to do with the Passover, Wormwood, and the Tree of the Knowledge of Good and Evil. But that connecting of the herbs and the grapes, I was, I've been looking for that. I, I figured it's got to be in there, and I found it this morning. 
And that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some things that are really cool about that. Anyway, I wanted to express to you that anybody can find uh, things here in the Bible, can find treasures in God's Word, and the key is not your brain. Uh, the key is the Holy Spirit. And so when you read your Bible every morning, I encourage you to read it as if God is standing right next to you or standing right behind you, you know, and ask questions while you're reading. God, what did you mean by that? God, why do these two verses seem to contradict? Uh, God, why I don't have a clue what you meant by this phrase right here. Why did you put that in there? God, why is this verse even in the Bible? God, why all these lists of names? You know, it's not being disrespectful. It's just saying, Lord... I want to understand why you did this. I believe you put it in there for a reason, and I'm trying to understand. Please show me. All right? And so if you start asking those questions, you know, if you believe what you're reading and believe that your King James Bible is the, is the perfect Word of God, you know, and you ask questions, you might not eventually, you might not get the answers right away, but eventually God will start giving you answers to your questions. This thing about the, the vine and the herbs, that was a question I asked six months ago. Six months ago, I came across something in, I, in my Bible, and I thought, there's got to be something in there. And then just this morning, God gave me the answer to that thing. I was like, yes. So that's, I love that. All right? Because I, ha I had a suspicion, but I couldn't prove it. And now I can prove it. So anyway, God didn't just tell you to dig in His Word just to keep you preoccupied, you know, while He takes a nap. You know, it's not like us with our kids, you know, and you're, <laughs> give them a tablet just so they'll leave you alone. You know, it's not, that's not how it is. That's terrible. That's horrible. They should be, don't do that. But he says, uh, uh, there's treasure to be desired and there's treasure in the Bible. And if there's treasure, then don't worry. We might be in the last days, but there's still a ton of unanswered questions in this Bible. And there's still loads of treasure to be discovered. And I'm going to show you something that I came across recently in my Bible study. And by asking these kinds of questions and the lesson today has to do with hidden details in the life of David. Hidden details in the life of David. And throughout the Bible, there are all kinds of kings whose birth dates, their death dates, their reign dates, and other significant dates are clearly recorded. And other kings, God just kind of skips over the whole thing or doesn't really give you the dates. And so when it comes to David, we know a few things in regards to his reign and his age and his dates. If you look, hold your finger where you're at, but look at 2 Samuel chapter 5. 2 Samuel chapter 5. And if you look in verse 4, it says, David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. All right? So in the passage... David uh, has been with the Philistines, and Saul has just died, and the nation of Judah, the, the tribe of Judah, has anointed him king. And in verse 5 it says, In Hebron he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem he reigned thirty and three years, Okay, when he's made king uh, over Israel, and is king over Jerusalem. Uh, so he's age thirty. I better do this in different colors, or this is going to get confusing real fast. All right. He reigns seven years in Hebron, 33 years in Jerusalem. Now, I don't, now Israel is a math whiz, and so I'm going to ask him, how, how, what is seven plus 33? I know it's been a while, but <laughs> I know it's summer break. Okay, so he reigns for 40 years. All right, so we know that he reigns for 40 years. So if, if David began his reign in Judah at age 30, like it says, and he reigned 40 years, now, for, now let's see if you can handle this one, Israel. What is 30 plus 40? 70. <laughs> what? What did you say? What? 602? He's homeschooled. All right, it's uh, 70. Seventy. All right. Okay. Oh boy. All right. So if if uh, David reigns for forty years and he's thirty years old when he begins to reign, that means that he died when he was seventy years old. Okay. We can put those little. We can connect those dots. Seventy and a half, if you want to be technical, but essentially seventy years old. He begins to reign at age thirty. David dies at age. 70. All right. Now that's pr pretty much the only specific dates that were really given in the life of David for the most part. But uh, we'll take a quick inventory of David's life. So you remember that in the story of David, you, we could get we could go into all kinds of real intricate details. But for the most part, the major events 
in the life of David is that he was anointed by Samuel. You remember that. And then he kills Goliath. Uh, he flees from Saul into the wilderness, right? And he's in the wilderness for a while uh, as a fugitive. Uh, toward the end of that time period, he goes and he lives with the Philistines for a little while. And uh, then after the death of Saul, uh, David is made king of the nation of Judah. And then seven years later, he's made king over the nation, the entire nation of Israel. And then we have, you know, the episode with Bathsheba. We have the episode with Absalom. And then we have finally the crowning and anointing of Solomon plus the death of David. Okay, that kind of gives you an overview of David's life as it's recorded in the scriptures. Now, it's important to understand that there were a lot of things that happened over the course of the 70 years of David's life. Undoubtedly, you could write volumes about all the things that David did. And there's a ton of things that aren't recorded in the Bible. You understand that. There's all kinds of things that God never recorded. Uh, the Bible only records a small portion of his, of his life. And it's important to realize that God chose this out of 70 years of all the things that happened in David's lifetime, of all the battles that he fought, of all the crazy things that happened, there are only certain little snapshots that God takes pictures of and records in the Scripture. And those are deliberate things. There's a reason why God chose certain things and left other things out. Okay? And part of the reason for that is that the events in David's life that are recorded uh, are very similar to events that will happen in the future. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of the events in David's life are pictures of prophecy. Okay? A lot of the things that happened to David are uh, things that are pictures of things that happened in the life of Jesus. Um, a lot of the things that take place in David's life are a type of things that will happen in the tribulation period. Okay? So there's reasons why God recorded certain things. There's a lot of prophecy concealed in the life of David. All right, and I'm going to touch on some of that as we go. So uh, let's try to, uh, I'll, as we go, as I do these lessons, I probably got at least one more lesson next week, probably one more after that, but we'll start filling in this thing as we go. Uh, but turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. All right. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. Okay. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? This is God speaking to Samuel. He says, Fill thine horn with oil and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite. Who else was born in Bethlehem that you can think of? Jesus. All right. David is already right off the bat. We're getting into a type of Jesus. David lives at Bethlehem. OK. And Jesse is a Bethlehemite for I have provided me a king among his sons, among the sons of Jesse. All right. And you know the story. The seven older brothers come and stand before Samuel and uh, Samuel's looking through all of them. Samuel thought that Eliab, the oldest brother, would certainly be king. Um, and you remember that uh, God told Samuel in verse seven something pretty significant. And it's good for us to remember. God says to Samuel, the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. That's always important to remember. We tend to look on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. Never forget that. And so Samuel, you know, he's going through all these kids. There's none of these people. God says, no, not him, not him, not him, not him, not him, not him. Seven times all the brothers pass by and Samuel's thinking, man, what? What's the deal? I thought one of these kids were supposed to be a son. He said, do you have any other kids? And uh, verse 11, it says, Samuel said to Jesse, are here all thy children? And he said, well, there remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. Okay. So they go and get David. Now there's something to notice here. For some reason, nobody in this family even thinks twice about Maybe we should call David. You know, nobody cares. <laughs> He's just a little runt that nobody, nobody even thought about bringing him to this event to meet the prophet. And they, nobody thought that it'd be worthwhile to bring him. Why do you think that is? Why would, why, if anybody had to guess, Judah, why do you think uh, they didn't bring David to that meeting? What about you, Asa? What do you think? Why, did, why didn't they bring David? 
Yeah, exactly. He was probably very young at this point. And he's old enough, but let's think about his age. Here's, like I said, we're going to get into the hidden details of the life of David. It doesn't say how old David was. He's not a baby. You know, you don't send a baby out to watch sheep. However old this kid is, David is, he's old enough to be out by himself in the fields where there are wolves trying to eat the sheep, okay? So he's probably not going to be nine years old. He's probably going to be old enough to have some responsibility to watch these sheep and also to be able to fight off a predator, potentially if it comes, without himself being eaten. You understand? So he's probably, if I had to guess, okay, I would assume, and now this is just an assumption, I can't prove this quite, but if I had to guess, I think it's legitimate and logical to assume that David is probably in his early teens here. He might be as old as Israel or something like that. Maybe, maybe 13, 14, 15. I think Israel could take on a wolf. Wouldn't you say if a wolf came and started attacking the sheep, attacking Penny, he'd go and fight off a wolf, right? Okay. <laughs> so, but either way, uh, you say, well, you can't prove that. Well, you can't disprove that either. So <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm just going to put uh, David at age 15, okay, uh, when he's... When he's anointed here, I think that's the date that I got here. Actually, no, I'm going to, well, yeah, sure. Uh, right around there. Okay, that's fine. All right, and then uh, verse 13, look at verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now look what happens, verse 14. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul... Remember, Saul was king, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. So the, the spirit of God was upon Saul. It goes upon David. And the thing that fills the void of Saul is an unclean, evil spirit, basically a demon, as we would say. All right. And Saul is being troubled now by a spirit. Now, this is happening in the spiritual realm, in the fourth dimension, if you will. And if you were in Saul's court in those days... You wouldn't see ghosts flying around, okay? You'd probably, what would have happened is you'd notice a peculiar change in Saul's temperament and his mentality. Maybe uh, you would think that Saul was having mental issues. Maybe you'd think that Saul, for some reason, is just uh, always depressed, and you wonder what the problem is. Or, you know, you've noticed that he acts very back and forth, you know, and he's happy one, one moment, and then he's really angry the next. And you'd be wondering, what is going on with Saul? And if a modern psychologist was to look at Saul and to uh, diagnose him, they'd probably say, oh, well, he has bipolar disorder. You know, or they would say, well, he has manic depressive disorder and we just need to prescribe Saul some Zoloft or, you know, some uh, Xanax or something like that. Make him feel better. Uh, the modern American psychiatry is based on materialism, right? And it assumes that all mental issues are caused by some kind of biological hormonal imbalance in the body, right? And so it can be fixed, consequently, by adjusting things in the body. So they try to use medication, they try to use pills to try to uh, get people's minds on track. And so consequently, because modern psychiatry is mostly materialistic, most of modern psychology is total garbage. Okay? Your mind, according to the Bible, is your human spirit. Okay? So mental problems can also be classified as human spirit problems. Sometimes there are biological hormonal imbalances that affect the mind. That's true. And I've talked about that. But, never, but always you want to balance that with sometimes a mental problem is a, a human spirit problem. And sometimes your spirit or your mind can be having problems due to it being attacked by another spirit. Okay? You understand that. Now bear in mind that at this time, when David is anointed, he's a complete nobody. Nobody even knows that David was anointed. This was a private thing. This was a secret thing. Okay? But what ends up happening is the palace doctor sees that Saul is having a problem, and he gives a prescription to have somebody play some nice music for Saul. And they're having a conversation. Well, who's going to play you know, the music? You know, Britney Spears? You know, uh, who's going to play the music? And uh, they don't, so they don't know. They're talking about it. Who's going to do it? And it, look, just who, look who just so happens to pop up in the conversation. Verse 18. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen Jesse, a son of, or I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning and playing, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Now, again, that 
you wouldn't say that to describe some eight-year-old kid, okay? He's probably a young teenager when, when they say that. But notice that they say, oh, there is this kid, and they're talking about David. How convenient. <laughs> what are the odds that they'd happen to pick him? Now, what's happening in the background in the spiritual realm is that God is moving David closer to the palace. But God has selected a king, but there was somebody that was aware of that, and it was Satan. And uh, Satan is interested in killing David. You say, why is Satan so interested in killing David? Well, because you remember that the Lord had told Satan in the Garden of Eden that he was going to raise up a seed that was going to smash the devil's head, you know, bash his brains out, bruise the, bruise the serpent's head. And so the serpent is interested in preventing that seed from coming. He either wants to prevent the seed from coming or kill the seed when it's a baby or kill it when it's a man. But basically he wants to take it out before it can take him out. He doesn't know which seed is going to be the one to bruise his head. So that's why he's after Abraham. He's after Isaac. He's after Jacob. He's after Moses. He's after Joshua. He's after David. He's after every single person in the line trying to take him out until he gets all the way up to Jesus, all right? So this would explain Saul's unreasonable hatred for David. Because you remember, Saul ends up hating David for almost no explanation. Why is that? Because he's got an evil spirit in him, an evil spirit of Satan that hates David, and he doesn't even know why. David didn't do anything wrong. He was always there to help Saul, and yet Saul tries to kill David multiple times. Can I just point out, that unreasonable, undeserved hatred of a servant of God or a brother in Christ is a characteristic of demon possession or is a characteristic of demonic influence at the very least, okay? Demonic activity. There's no explanation for unmerited, unreasonable hatred of a brother. That's satanic. Okay? And the music ends up alleviating Saul's pos uh, possession problem, and, and Saul and David become close friends. Look at verse 21. And David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. Okay, so David is Saul's armor bearer. Uh, does anybody know what an armor bearer is? Israel, do you know what an armor bearer is? Yeah, pretty much. If you go into battle, he's the guy holding the shield. He's kind of like a war caddy, you know. Hand me my nine iron, you know, and my sword. <laughs> you know, and my spear, you know, hand me my sword, hand me my spear, hand me my nunchucks. You know, he holds the, the, the shield, you know, and so he's the armor bearer, okay. And let's see, where are we at here? Uh, look at... Uh, he, he's the combat caddy, all right? So chapter 17, all right? We're moving through the life of David, trying to pick out some things that are interesting, all right? Notice in the, in the next chapter, there's an actual war that's brewing, but for some reason, uh, you know, the Philistines have Goliath, and they're coming against Israel, but David is sent home. Now, that's interesting. 1 Samuel 17, look at verse 11, all right? And when Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, that's Goliath the giant, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Verse 12. Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons. And the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons that went to the battle were... Uh, Mark, would you read those names for me real quick? Eliab. Abinadab and Shama. Okay. All right. And it says, And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. All right. So I'm going to put David down here. And the three eldest followed Saul. Saul. Okay. And verse 15, but David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Now, again, we're not told how old David is, but this text gives us a pretty obvious hint as to, an, as to, an, as to his age. Uh, look at chapter 14, verse 52. The thing that you want to remember here is that back in these days, King Saul was 
enlisting, he was drafting practically every able-bodied man he could find. And remember that David was a valiant man, a man of war, as they said. He's a fighter. They could tell just by looking at him. This guy's a tough little kid. Um, but verse 52 of chapter 14, it says there was sore war against the Philistines all the days of Saul. And when Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he took him unto him. But then why is David sent home? It doesn't even make sense. Why is David sent home? Does anybody want to take a guess why David was sent home? What was that? He wasn't a man yet. Pretty much, yeah. That's the answer. Cha uh, Numbers chapter 1, verse 3 says that the age of enlistment in the military, in the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, uh, is 20 years old. Numbers chapter 1, verse 3, from 20 years old and upward, all that are able to go forth to war in Israel, thou and Aaron shalt number them by their families. In the Mosaic law, you could not join the military until you were 20 years old. That tells you why David was sent home, because he was still a teenager at this time when Goliath comes. OK, uh, so you have these three oldest brothers who are who are in the military. But David had to be sent home. Uh, David had seven older brothers, according to First Samuel 16, verse 10, which means that he's the eighth. But I want you to see something. Hold your finger there. Look at First Chronicles, chapter two. First Chronicles chapter 2. In Israel, would you read First Chronicles chapter 2, verse 15? First Chronicles 2. Actually, read verse uh, 13 and 14, I think, because I want to get the names of these other brothers. I think it's First uh, Chronicles chapter 2, verse 13, 14, and 15. Uh, you don't have to read the rest of that. All right. Uh, Ozem. Ozem. My marker's given out. Now, did that verse in verse 15 just say that David was the seventh? Then how come 1 Samuel 16 verse uh, 10 said that uh, David, or uh, verse, uh, uh, which one? Uh, where were we? We just saw it. Oh, eight sons. First Samuel seventeen twelve. How come it says that uh, Jesse has eight sons and David's the youngest? One of them must have died. Yeah, that might be a possibility. Possibility. This is what we so so in one passage we have it says that David's the eighth, and then in Chronicles it says David is number seven. Okay, he's the youngest. So we have what looks like in a, what we call an apparent contradiction in the Bible. In one place, it says he's the seventh. In another place, it says he's the eighth. Now, before we get into the answers here, you have two options. You can either say that the Bible has errors in it, you know, and maybe we need a new and better translation to fix these problems. Or maybe it's imperfect, you know, because, you know, the Bible's written by men. And so maybe that's why we have these contradictions, these apparent contradictions in the Bible. The other option is you can believe that the Bible is the perfect Judah. Pay, pay attention. Ta Tyler, Taylor, pay attention. You can believe that the Bible is the perfect word of God, and God puts these apparent contradictions in there for a reason. Okay? Now, that's my position, and that's the position of this church officially, that the King James Bible, this Bible is the perfect words of God without any error. Okay? And uh, there's, it's perfect. And so with that position, we're still left with the verse, though, that says in one place David is the seventh, and in another place that David is the eighth. Now, what are some possible explanations as to why this contradiction shows up in the Bible? Well, as Brother Rowley said, one reason is that maybe David had a, uh, maybe when Samuel came to anoint, the chil uh, to anoint the king and all the kids passed before him, he had seven older brothers and he was the eighth. But later on, when the chronicler recorded uh, David's family, one of these brothers maybe had died, you know, died of a car wreck, died in battle, died in, you know, whatever. Uh, and so when he writes it in Chronicles by that time, yeah, he only has six older brothers and David's the seventh. That's a possibility. That's a legitimate possibility. Therefore, this isn't a contradiction because we have a legitimate possibility. Okay. 
So that throws out the problem of, well, the Bible has contradictions. That's not true. Um, there's one other possibility. Does anybody, other, anybody else know what the other possibility might be as to why David is that? So I think it's probably along the lines of Brother Allen. Um, there's a one instance, I think there's that one instance, the brother could have been a wicked brother, and therefore the name was left out kind of the same way uh, in Matthew 1, where, the, where Jeconiah is left out, and as well as I think even Judah's sons, Ur and On. Hmm. Yeah, sure. I know what you're talking about. You no, know, I'm talking about where if they were wicked, they didn't necessarily die, but because they were just they were wicked men. Right, it's almost like their name was blotted out for being so wicked. And so that, that's a possibility. I didn't even write that one down. That is something that we see in the Bible. Sometimes God will just not record a name because of their wickedness. That's possible. Judah, what do you think? Did he die by a sickness? Uh, well, it, we don't know. That might be a possibility. One of his brothers might have died. But uh, there's another possibility that would be also uh, applicable, is that maybe one of these boys, and I'll just say this one, what if there was a twin what if one of his older brothers had, was a twin? That way, David would be the eighth, and all seven of them would have passed by him. But when the chronicler is writing, he's, say, he's going down in order. He doesn't have to record the twin. There's no need. He's just going down in order, and he's saying that David is the seventh. He's the seventh pregnancy that his mother had. And that's perfectly applicable. She had seven pregnancies, uh, but technically David's the eighth kid of the seventh pregnancy. Now, one thing that's very interesting about that is that you can say that, therefore, and hopefully the, uh, hopefully the camera can see that angle right there, but uh, you could say that David is the seventh and the eighth, right? Now turn to Revelation chapter 17. Who else do you know of that's the seventh and the eighth? Hmm. Like I said, this is kind of a Bible study this morning, more than anything. I'll read it for you. Revelation chapter 17, verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not the Antichrist. He shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, and they're gonna, the world's going to wonder and all that. All right, verse uh, 10. There are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. Okay? Can't be Rome. Other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space, speaking of the man of sin, the Antichrist. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. So the Antichrist is a seven and an eighth. You say, well, yeah, that kind of matches, but what does that have to do with David? Nothing. Except practically everything Satan does is a counterfeit of what God does, right? Okay, so taking that for granted, that everything the Antichrist does, anti is uh, in, instead of or against, Antichrist, he's a counterfeit of Jesus Christ. If the Antichrist is going to be a seventh and an eighth, then it stands to reason that maybe Jesus is a seventh and the eighth. Turn to Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5. Now, I'm going to show you a passage of Scripture that's uh, very cryptic. Nobody's got this verse figured out. I don't profess to have it figured out, but I feel like I'm on the right track. Micah, chapter 5. And uh, let's see. Dr. Ruckman's note, if you have Dr. Ruckman's reference Bible, on Micah, chapter 5, verse 4 and 5 is... Uh, the verse has never been properly exegeted by any commentator, Ish Weish Nish. <laughs> That's his note on Micah chapter 5, verse 4 and 5. Let's read it. All right. Uh, context in verse 2 is Jesus out of Bethlehem. Here comes the one that's going to rule from Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. That's Jesus. Okay. Verse 4, And he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide. For now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. That's Jesus. And when this man shall be the peace, Jesus, when the Assyrian, that's the Antichrist, shall come into our land, and when he shall tread in our palaces, then shall we raise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men. 
All right, so we have the Antichrist in the context, we have Jesus in the context, and he says, we're going to raise against the Assyrian seven shepherds and eight principal men. That's that same type of thing. It's not 15 people we're going to bring against him. It's, we're going to bring against seven, but the seventh is going to be the eighth type of thing. And it's talking about Jesus. In the passage, it's a shepherd. He says, we're going to raise against this Assyrian these shepherds. Now, I don't uh, know for sure what that verse is talking about, but to me it looks like the Lord raises up seven shepherds against the Assyrian. The seventh is Jesus Christ, who dies but then rises from the dead, and therefore he's also the eighth, just like the Antichrist. And if that theory is right, then there should be in the Bible six other shepherds who go up against types of the Antichrist. And I've got a few of them. I don't have it all. Okay, I've got a couple of them, but Moses versus Pharaoh. That's one. Moses was a shepherd. How about this? Cyrus versus the king of Babylon. Cyrus is called a shepherd in Isaiah 44, 28. How about David, a shepherd, versus Goliath, type of the Antichrist? There's three shepherds. All right, now we know Jesus Christ would be the seventh shepherd against a type of the Antichrist, Judas Iscariot, you might say. Uh, Jesus also at the second advent against the Antichrist himself. That's the eighth. Okay, so I've got number four, number five, and number six I'm not sure about yet. You have Abel, he's a shepherd, up against Cain, a type of the Antichrist, that might fit. Uh, Jeremiah and Amos were both shepherds, but I'm not sure about, their, about them, so there's still some digging to be done. But there's something where the Antichrist uh, is the seventh and the eighth. And there's a thing where David is the seventh and the eighth. David is a type of Christ. The Antichrist copies everything Jesus does. So there's something, it pretty much guarantees that there's going to have to be a 7-8 seven, seven thing with Jesus Christ in the Bible. I, just, I find that interesting. Now, uh, we'll go back to 1 Samuel chapter 17. I point that this little detail out is about David being the 7th and the 8th because it uh, tells us something about our estimation of David's age when he fought Goliath. Now remember, David had three older brothers that joined the military, only three of them. So that tells you if Saul is enlisting everybody he can, the reason why number four, number five, and number six weren't uh, enlisted into Saul's military is because they were under 20 years old also. All right, so I'm going to put Shammah at 20 years old. I'm going to be generous and say that Abinadab is uh, 22, and we'll say Eliab is 23. Can't prove that, but they're at least 20 years old and upward. All right, now, uh, David, the third oldest brother, okay, is, is 20, probably just, just barely made the draft, which means that uh, the two older brothers are over 20, but there's still three older brothers that are older than David, and if we're uh, very generous and allow uh, David's mother to be a very fertile woman, let's say, uh, and having one kid a year, look at where that puts David. Nathaniel's not in the military because he's only 19. Radii is 18. Ozem is 17. Like I said, that's if she's having one kid a year, just, you know, popping kids out. At the very youngest, at the very least, David, when he fights Goliath, Goliath is 16 years old. David can't be any older than 16. And if David didn't have a twin, and the first theory is true that he had a, an additional brother that died at some point, he'd be even younger than that. He'd have to be 15 or younger. Because you can only have one kid a year, pretty much. You know, every nine months. You, you just, that's just how nature works. So this is, this is something that I don't have to guess about. I mean, there's no doubt that these three older brothers are in the military. The rest of them can't because they're too young. And that, at a minimum, makes David 16. He can't be any older than 16. Now think about that. The bottom line is, when David fought the lion and the bear and then Goliath, he could have not been any older than 16 years old. Could you imagine fighting a lion at 16 years old? Yeah. <laughs> Judah can't. Could you? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I can't imagine fighting one. Of, I'm 36, and I can't imagine fighting a lion. I can't imagine fighting a bear. You know, he fought a lion and a bear. At, how about a special ops soldier who's a giant at nine and a half feet tall when you're 16, fighting somebody like that? Now, bear in mind that David wasn't able to do these things because he was super buff or just a super crazy guy. 
you know, or uh, super lucky. David was a teenager who had 100% trust and confidence in the Lord. Amen. David was a young teenager. Okay, think about that. He's not much older than you boys right now. David was a young teenager like you who gave his life to the Lord and basically told God, my life is yours, do whatever, whatever you want with it. Okay, he was fully submitted to God. God is looking for some young men who have that kind of faith, who have that kind of boldness, and who have that kind of courage. And God is not worried about any enemy. He can beat anyone and everyone that comes up against Him, but God is looking for someone who He can uh, use, who truly believes that God can defeat any enemy and overcome any obstacle. Do you believe that God can do that? Do you believe that God can use you? You say, oh, well, not me. I'm too young. I'm too sinful. I'm too shy. I'm too nervous. God can use you if you'll let him. And you and God have to come to that agreement because God will not make you do anything. But if you want to live a life that's exciting and that will actually count and actually matter, if you want a life that will actually count for something, give your life to God and serve the Lord. And you'll get some action for sure. <laughs> uh, David did. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 17 again. 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel 17, look at verse 23. All right. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him, and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, what shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? And David ends up speaking to Saul. You know the story. And Saul ends up uh, telling him, okay, you can go out and fight Goliath. Now remember, Saul's king, and David's 16 years old. And Saul is going to allow him to go fight Goliath. And you remember the deal. Whoever loses the battle... The other team has to yield to the other enemy. Basically, they're going to fight a war, but rather, that's just that's not to kill everybody. Let's just have two people fight. Whoever wins, wins. And if uh, our guy wins, you have to surrender. And if, he lo and if your guy wins, we'll surrender. Oh, okay, well, yeah, that's a good deal. You only win, uh, lose one life. Hey, that's a good deal. Um, remember, that's the deal, but Saul says, okay, uh, I'll send this 16-year-old out to fight him. That sounds kind of crazy. But you have to remember that there was nobody else in Saul's army who had killed a lion or a bear, much less a lion and a bear. <laughs> so right now, David's our, our best shot. You know, and even Jonathan, he would have been good. But Saul doesn't even send out Jonathan to fight him. All right. Now, you know from the story that Goliath had a huge spear and a huge sword. But look at what David arms himself with in verse 40. 1 Samuel 17, 40. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So you remember, he's got the scrip with the little rocks in it, and he's got his sling, a little slingshot, and he's got a stick. You know, and uh, the Goliath mocks him and says, what am I, a dog? You're going you're to throw your, my your stick so I can go fetch your stick? What do you think I am? A dog? Who are you? Why are you sending this little runt after me to fight me? Okay, I'm going to take your head off. You know, it's basically what ends up going on. Now, it says that David took five smooth stones. Why five? Why not one? Why not eight? Why not 50? Right? Why not have two banana clips of smooth stones ready to go? You know, just in case you need to shoot multiple times. <laughs> right? Why did David take five stones? Miss Jane. Because there were five more giants. That's right. There was a total of five giants. Did you guys know that? If you were looking at that army of the Philistines, you'd see Goliath, the champion, come up. But if you were looking at him, you'd see head, head, head. Tall head, t head, 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 another tall head. There's four more giants standing back there. They were all un undoubtedly related to Goliath. David saw five giants, and so he takes five stones. Brother Rowley? Five is also the number of death. That's right. Five is the number of death. And so David's ready to kill some giants, so he gets five <laughs> stones. All right. Five di David didn't get five stones because he was worried about missing. 
Uh, he got five stones because he was figuring that he'd probably have to end up fighting five giants. And isn't David's confidence amazing? I mean, 16 years old, and this is how, this is what's going through his mind. He picks up one rock and starts going, he's like, wait a second, there's four more giants. I better get a couple more. <laughs> he's not thinking, wait a second, there's five giants, what am I doing? <laughs> I am out of here. <laughs> no, he gets five stones and he's ready to fight all five of them. That's amazing. And uh, David wasn't intimidated by one giant or five giants or a hundred giants. Why? Because David knew that God is bigger than any and all giants. Do you have that kind of confidence in God? Did you know there's not a single record in the Bible of a giant ever killing anybody? They always lose. And yet people are always terrified of them. But God's man can always beat the giant. All right? David had confidence in God. And did you know that the God that David worshipped and the God that David served is the same exact God that you worship when we sang songs this morning and that you serve? The same God that you asked to save your soul from hell and you believed in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, the God that died on a cross for you is the same God that David worshipped and that, knew, that, God, that David knew would take care of this problem for him. Do you think that God is able to beat the giant problems in your life? Do you think He is? Then what are you so worried about? What are you so panicked over? What are you so concerned about? Why do you lay awake at night so worried about the future? You have God Almighty on your side. The Bible says, if God be for us, who can be against us? It literally makes no sense whatsoever, when you think about it, for Christians to fret and worry about things, and yet so often we do, right? So often we do. Now, the question is, is the problem with God because, you know, well, I don't know if God can handle this. Or is the problem with you? <laughs> you know the answer to that. The problem is your lack of faith in your almighty God. Jesus said, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? What are you doing? The two things in Scripture, you know, that Jesus marveled at is faith and a lack of faith. Those two things. Those two things uh, are shocking to the Lord. And it must be shocking and fairly frustrating for God when His people doubt Him. I mean, He can do literally anything. <laughs> he created the universe, and yet His children still doubt Him. That's, that, that's shocking. He marvels at that. But then it's also shocking to God when someone actually does go all out and trust in Him 100%. That's shocking because it's so rare. <laughs> Wait, what? Somebody down there actually believes me? Somebody down there actually believes that I, I preserved and gave a perfect Bible? Somebody actually believes that? Somebody actually believes that I can take care of them? Finally! <laughs> he marvels at that. As uh, D.L. Moody said, you know the quote, The world has yet to see what God can do with and for and through and in a man who is fully and wholly consecrated to him. Actually, the world has seen a handful of, has seen a handful of those men, and David was one of them. And that's why his life is so incredible. Because David was fully consecrated to God. He was a man after God's own heart. What about you? Finally, I want to point out one last thing for today. So Goliath represents the devil or maybe a problem in your life. And uh, maybe you've got a big problem and you're wondering about how to overcome it. Well, uh, let me give you something that's super basic, super practical. You know, we've gone into some deep stuff with Jesus being the seventh and the eighth and all this. Let me just give you something real just surface, okay? You've got a problem in your life. Take some advice from David. Take five smooth stones specifically designed for that problem. You say, what do you, mean? what do you mean? The Word of God is your offensive we weapon against the enemy, right? Okay? And we're to fight and resist the devil with Scripture, right? Okay, we'll get into the habit of memorizing five verses of Scripture that deal with your particular problem. That's good advice. Uh, these five stones might be a little rough at first. You know, you pick out your five verses. They're a little rough at first. You might have trouble remembering them at first. But as you quote them over and over, you know, those stones are going to get real smooth. Those verses are going to get real smooth. And when that problem of, you know, financial worries comes up, you can reach into your script 
you know, your scripture, right? Your uh, Bible and sling out a verse that's going to smash that problem in the face, <laughs> you know? But my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Bam! Take out that problem, you know? Uh, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Pow! You know, financial problem, you're worried about money. Uh, the Bible says, I have been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging bread. Boom! Take out those enemies. You can do the same thing for any problem. You got marital problems? Get five verses of Scripture on marriage. Memorize it. Get those things ready so when the devil comes around and that giant comes around and starts to intimidate you again, starts mocking you and making you scared, start getting that thing going in your head. I've, I've, there's verses for me that I've quoted probably 10,000 times in my lifetime. And I still do to this day. Because I need it. Because those stinging giants just keep popping up in my life. But the, the Scripture works. It sure works. You got parenting problems? Find five verses of Scripture. You got health problems? Memorize five verses of Scripture. You got problems at work? Memorize five verses of Scripture. Problems at school? Memorize five verses of Scripture that deal with it. You got trouble with girls? Trouble with boys? Boyfriend, girlfriend stuff? Memorize five verses of Scripture on that stuff. You got problems with stress? Memorize five verses of Scripture. Uh, memorize Scripture. It will help you, a, and you'll get the victory if you'll have faith in God. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that he's a, He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. David overcame the Goli uh, Goliath by faith. So I hope you learned something this morning. I'll have some more hidden details in the life of David next week, and it's going to get pretty interesting if you ask me. So uh, be sure to be here next week. Let's uh, close in a word of prayer. Father, I come before you this morning. I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you, God, for these amazing things in the Bible. And it's really, uh, I hope it puts some things into context, God, when people read this story about David and Goliath. Uh, I pray, Father, that uh, you'd help us to remember that he was just a, a kid. Lord, uh, he was half my age, Lord, and uh, he was 16 years old when he went up against this giant. And uh, that's incredible. I pray that, Father, you'd uh, raise up some young teenagers, God, that would actually be interested in the Bible and the things of God and interested in doing something for you, God, because uh, you're interested in using teenagers, Lord. And uh, I pray that you'd help people to remember that. And uh, it's not just pastors and missionaries and old people that God is interested in using. God wants to use some young men. And so, Father, I pray you'd raise up some young men that even in this church, that we could train in the Word of God and send out to serve you. And Lord, we just pray that uh, you bless the remainder of this service. Thank you for what you've done for us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you are dismissed.